Yes, watch on the net. Watch it. And welcome to yet another episode of the Lines Up by Donkeys podcast. I'm Joe, and with me, as always, seemingly now, Sarah from It Came from the Sea. What up? Hello. All right. Someone said that um, you're replacing Nick, and I I would instead say you're more like a diet Nick. You're like yeah. Nick, but without all the Catholic Church jokes. It's true. Yeah, and a little less sugar. <laughs> a little, little less sugar. Um, we're recording very early in the morning for at least for us. Um, <laughs> I just woke up uh, because we're trying to record a series before it gets way too hot on, on our little island. Uh, and I prepared for this episode by having a cup of coffee that I promptly filled with expired coffee creamer um, without <laughs> How knowing. Expired? How expired? Was it chunky expired or just sour expired? It wasn't chunky expired. It was. Mm. It tasted like there was a party in my mouth and everybody's throwing up, though. It's like that sleeper expired milk flavor. Yeah, which is actually uh, today's sponsor of the show, uh, Expired Coffee Creamer from the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> did did you buy it? Like, how, when did you buy it? Everything gets expired here immediately, though. Like, so uh, not as long ago as you'd expect. <laughs> yeah, sounds for, about right. But for a liquid that's mostly sugar and milk byproduct, because it's not like I was buying like organic shit. Everybody knows how much money I make from this show. It's public <laughs> knowledge. Uh, but it, it was old enough. <laughs> now, uh. This is an episode or a series, rather, I thought you'd make a very good guest on. Um, and it's not because that you're closely connected to this topic <laughs> at all. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, have you ever heard uh, of a guy named Monty Melconian? Not really. You've told me a little bit about him, but before that, I hadn't heard anything. So Monty Melconian um, is probably one of the weirdest military heroes of all time. Uh, and I say that mostly because um, he's an Armenian military hero, despite the fact he is born about 30 minutes away from our, our, our lovely co-host Nick uh, huh. in California. <laughs> um, and certainly not for uh, uh, reasons doing from like recent events whatsoever. We're going to talk about how an American became an Armenian military hero. Uh, for no particular reason, not related no- to anybody you know, on the podcast right now. Yeah, not even remotely. Um, <laughs> now, he is uh, enshrined in Armenia as Commander Avo. Uh, now, ev- obviously, every Armenian would know know who Monty Melkonian is. Uh, he There's currently more statues of Monty Melkonian than Lenin in Armenia. Uh, but uh, people will lovingly call him Commander Avo. I will call him something of the Forrest Gump of revolution. Um <laughs> And I mean that in the best way possible. I mean the the movie Forrest Gump, not the book Forrest Gump. Um, have you ever read the book Forrest Gump? I've heard it's like horribly depressing. Yeah, and he's like a violent alcoholic. I don't mean that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he abuses some people. Um, We're going for the fun shenanigans of Tom Hanks. That kind that's of right. revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I should point out my source for this book um, because someone will immediately correct me on this. Uh, and it's not the greatest uh, history research I've ever done because it's a very hard thing to research. Um, there's very few resources uh, when it comes to researching Monty's life in English. And I don't speak fluent Armenian. Uh, and I was not going to learn for this podcast. Um, <laughs> Uh, the book is called My Brother's Road, and it's written by Monty's brother, Markar. Um, so obviously, some things might be glossed over, and maybe Monty's mythos has blown up just a little bit throughout. However, I do have to say Markar was pretty fair in judging his brother's legacy. Um, more fair than my brother would probably be <laughs> uh, if I was to die a revolutionary hero. <laughs> yeah, my family would not write a flattering review of my life. Yeah, like he, uh, Markar's pretty upfront that Monty was a flawed guy. Um, and, uh, he might have tried to smooth out some of the edges, but that's a very hard thing to do when you're talking about the fact that your brother was quite literally a terrorist for a large part right. of his life. Um, no question. That's not going to be relevant to anything else going on. Were they one of those families where everybody, like, every child had a name that started with the same letter as their last name? I don't know. Um, <laughs> they got I, Monty and Marco. Uh, um, I, I don't know what if they had another sibling, actually. Uh, I assume and, they did. It was like Mickey. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. The traditional Armenian name, Mickey. 
Yeah. Uh, Mickey Mouseian. Um, <laughs> now, Mont- <laughs> well, look, he's an immigrant. He changed his name when he got here and started working for Walt Disney. <laughs> Uh, so Monty Melconian was born on November 25th, 1957 in Visalia, California. I probably mispronounced that. Visalia? Visalia? It's California. Mm. I don't care. Um, his father chose the name Monty because he wanted something short and, uh, as his father put it, quote, something that would sound good over loudspeakers. Uh, I'm sure he did not mean the way that that would eventually mean. (laughs) Uh, Monkey paw curls. (laughs) <laughs> I think he wanted his son to be like a baseball star or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, despite what he would eventually become, Monty was an exceedingly American kid. and uh, His parents were a carpenter and a school teacher, and they hardly ever spoke to him about his Armenian heritage. Something I will point out that is very fucking rare for any Armenian family. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, even for my very non-Armenian family growing up, uh, it, it was very... Uh, obvious that we were Armenian. We talked about it all the time. Uh, it was very important to our culture, uh, even though like none of us have Armenian names. Um, Do you know when like when his parents came to the U.S.? Uh, they were born here. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. Uh, part of it. His, uh, his grandfather had immigrated right after the genocide. Mm. Um, now, they would vaguely tell stories of what they called the old country, as they called it, but that was about it. They never, like, they didn't send them to Armenian school, which is very common. They didn't go to an Armenian church. I think they went to, like, a Presbyterian church. Hmm. Um, they, they were forcing assimilation onto their family. Um, instead of doing any of that, he focused on doing American kid stuff, like playing baseball and joining the Boy Scouts. Uh, Monty, despite the era he grew up in being, you know, the 1950s, uh, he was friends with everyone. Um, he didn't have, like, his parents weren't racist, so he didn't have that imprinted onto him by society. And he was very loyal to his friends. Uh, he didn't understand American racism because, as many Americans know, uh, 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 well, fuck, I gotta say that again. Uh, he didn't quite understand American racism because uh, anybody who knows an Armenian or is Armenian themselves knows we get a little dark when we tan. Uh, so he actually was a victim of racism himself. Uh, he was kicked out of a segregated pool because white people thought he was mixed race. Jesus. Uh, now, nobody ever accused racists of being smart or even understanding their own hatred. Um, true. So fuck, yeah. Um, uh, now, Monty's upbringing was uh, uh, purposely very American. Uh, like I said, they changed their church uh, rather than the traditional Armenian Apostolic Church or Armenian Orthodox Church. Um, even though that's one of the oldest dominion, uh, dom- denominations of Christianity on earth. Um, in doing so, it meant that uh, he never learned the Armenian language or anything about his own culture. Because of this, he never became religious, a point of contention that continues in mainstream Armenia and uh, Armenian culture at large when it comes regarding him. A lot of people try forcing religious beliefs onto him. He never really had. Um, at, at no point did he ever say he was, he was, he was a Marxist. He really did not like religion. <laughs> uh, but I mean, Armenia is a very, very religious country and they, they try to foist that onto his, onto his mythos. And it's just at no point does Mark R really bring that up. It, um, it, he talked vaguely of like a higher power, but he was not a religious man. Um, now, uh, Monty was in the Boy Scouts, though he eventually quit because he earned every badge uh, that he could get and got bored. Uh, which, <laughs> it, honestly, it, it ends up being a bit of a trend throughout his life. Pretty much everything that he tries, he excels at immediately, gets bored, and quits. Um, huh. Yeah, which is not a problem I've ever had. <laughs> I get uh, very mediocre very quickly, and then I quit. <laughs> See, that, that's, the, that's the truly American experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Monty started playing Little League, and he soon quit because he saw that uh, playing with kids his age were no longer a challenge. Hmm. Um, and this is where Markar begins to, to leak out that uh, Monty was a bit of a bastard. Uh, he was short-tempered and loved fighting. Um, though he tried not to fight for no reason, uh, though he would fight his brother all the time because, you know, of course. Well, they're related. That's enough of a reason. Yeah, uh, and, and Markar points out that at no point uh, when Monty... Monty was always the bigger and stronger of the two and would beat the dog shit out of Markar, and he never once apologized for it. Oh, <laughs> Which, yeah, I mean, this sounds like a big brother. Um, and, and, like, it, he in his own accounts, Markar points out he never once beat his, his older brother in anything, and that's something, as a younger brother, I have solidarity in. Um, 
Now, I mean, Markar Ma- beat him in one thing, but we'll get it. <laughs> yeah, Mati, or Markar is still alive. Take that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, the ultimate win. Uh, Monty also found himself being discriminated against and along with some of his friends who are mostly Mexican. Uh, so he decided to pick fights with other white kids for being racist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at other points, when white kids uh, attempted to pick on Mexicans, Monty would tell them that he was Mexican, too. Uh, so they would try to fight him. <laughs> and, and then he would promptly beat their ass. Um, which, rad. I, I love yeah, that. Yeah, that's pretty dope. Um, and eventually, uh, their little weird white suburban life got uprooted because uh, Monty's dad decided it would be very good for their family if he sold all of their belongings. They went on a European backpacking trip for Honestly, a while. That sounds pretty fucking rad, too. Yeah, that's back when you could do stuff like that. Um, yeah. And that's what they did. They landed in Keflavik, Iceland, and slowly traveled down through the mainland. Um, while traveling through Europe, they hit Amsterdam, and it was there they met another Armenian family. Uh, and that was the first time that Monty heard about the genocide of 1915, which is just the you know, normal conversation what? that occurs between two <laughs> yeah. Armenians. I've actually experienced he? this. Uh, he was maybe a teenager. I don't. I don't think a, a teenager yet. Okay. Okay. Still pretty pretty young. And I can explain that this actually happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like how do how do you start that conversation? Normally, what happens is when two Armenians meet one another, you quickly try to discover if you're related or not. Um, th- this is normally dependent not on your last name, though sometimes it is, but where your family's originally from, because a lot of Armenians are from eastern Anatolia, which was taken over by Turkey, um, which then leads into stories about the genocide and how your family still exists. This is a okay. very common occurrence. <laughs> and this is how my family escaped the genocide. This is literally a conversation, uh, like a few months ago, I had Dr. Bacallian on the show. We had this ex- exact same conversation, and we found out I, we are almost certainly related. That's fantastic. <laughs> this happens all the time. Um, now, remember, his family never talked about it with him, um, and this is the first time he ever heard of it. Um, his, his family wanted to shield him from anything to do with his Armenian culture uh, because they wanted to become an American boy and assimilate. Uh, side note here, assimilation is racist. Moving on. Yeah. Yep. (laughs) On their trip, they eventually made it to uh, Castellón, Spain, um, which I I think I pronounced that right. I don't know. Mm. Um, And their father decided they should enroll in a Spanish language school. At this point, they've just moved to Europe. Uh, Yeah. What? They're they're European drifters. Um, They just immigrated with extra steps. Yeah. Um. And, and while in a Spanish language school uh, where Monty was learning Spanish, one of many languages he had learned over the years, uh, a teacher asked Monty where he was from. And Monty, of course, responded that he was from America. And the teacher said, no, where are you really from? Because white Spanish people are about as racist yeah. as Americans. Racism be like that. Though, as fucked up as a question this is, this happens to me a lot. Uh, but it, it was something that Monty never thought about. Like, he wanted to know where his ancestors came from. And he had no real answer. He knew what Armenia was, but he couldn't point it, even point it out on a map. Um, but more than that, it mentally changed him. It broke his idea of how he saw himself because how others saw him. Others did not see him as a kid from California, just another, another an, a normal American kid. They saw him as an Armenian. And it was after this, they took a long bus ride through Turkey. Something <laughs> I would not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they visited their ancestral home village. Another thing I would highly not recommend. Uh, that it was a different time, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and he, they're originally from the village of Mersifon, um, currently known by a different illegal name, which I will not say. Um, not, now, in my defense, I never claimed I was going to be fair and balanced in the series. <laughs> Uh, though when we do talk about the uh, the 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 first art sock war, I will do my best to remain kind of neutral, um, mm. but not now. Uh, now, Mersifon was once the home of tens of thousands of Armenians, and that had been reduced to just a couple people due to the genocide. Uh, using an old map and a town guide, they found the house of their great grandfather Misak Karamijian, which is currently occupied by a Turkish family. Ugh. Uh, um, Another M name, though, gotta say. <laughs> it, it's a trend. Yeah. Uh, it was then they discovered that the town guide was a, was also a descendant of, of an Armenian family, but they had changed their name and their religion to sell out their neighbors to the Ottoman Empire in order to save their lives. Yep. 
Yep. Um, now this yeah. did happen, and it happened quite a lot. Um, and this actually kind of instilled something in Monty of like a bitter hatred of of traders, uh, of people that like he it, it taught him a lesson that just because someone is being loyal to you does not mean that they actually will be. Right. And it, it, and it pretty badly affected his life for quite a while. Um, and I would say it probably affected a lot of his revolutionary relationships as well. <laughs> um, he's kind of a paranoid dude. Um, years later, uh, Monty marked this visit uh, to Mersifon as um, a pivotal moment in his life that changed everything. He told his partner Seta, or, or sometimes it's read at Seta uh, with a T or a D, but it doesn't really matter. So he told a journalist that uh, when, once he was there, he saw what we had lost that day. Mm. Um, and this being uh, Greater Armenia. Now, there's a joke. Uh, like Me and Travis used to make a joke of Greater Kurdistan encompasses the entire world. Um, <laughs> but Greater Armenia was an actual historical thing that did exist at one point. Um, and he saw what his family had lost, more importantly. Uh, when the family returned to Europe, Monty was a changed man. He began to teach himself everything he could about Armenian history and culture, and he attempted to teach himself the language, though badly, which I could also stand yeah, all day. Fair. Uh, I assume it's the 60s version equivalent of just using Babelfish or whatever. Um, well, probably just flashcards. Yeah, I guess. Um, he also began to loathe many, uh, loathe many of his own family members. He saw them as idiots who let the American dream steal their culture and identity, attempting to assimilate them into a culture, or a culture and a country that would simply never accept them. He's not wrong. He's absolutely not wrong. Um, it's kind of harsh. Yeah. He thought they were sellouts, turning themselves for, uh, what he called a cheap trick for capitalism. So not only did Monty begin his Armenian journey, but also his education left his politics as well. Uh, his parents mostly stayed uh, quiet on the topic, um, which is more than I expected. Uh, kind of just allowing their teenage son to self-radicalize. <laughs> Though it wasn't quite to that point yet. Um, I would say he was the edgy kid you knew in high school uh, who probably wore like a Che Guevara shirt, but didn't, yeah. quite, uh, didn't quite understand what he was talking about yet. Didn't really understand that buying a Che Guevara shirt at like Spencer's kind of defeated the purpose. Yeah, uh, though he was mostly uh, learning about the horrors of Armenian history, though through the lens of a lot of leftist theory, which honestly mm. is the way to do it. Um, the one day um, his mom told him that if it wasn't for the massacres of the genocide, they would never they would never had the uh, ability to be born in America. This infuriated Mari to no end. Oh, oh no. <laughs> He pointed out, quite rightly, that the, the growing up in suburban California was not, in fact, worth the slaughter of millions. Yeah, what the fuck, mom? Yeah, imagine like being such a dumbass, your, your teenage son dunks on you that hard about your own culture. <laughs> Instead, he decided the only thing that he could do to repay the genocide was securing the lost ancestral lands of the Armenian people. Though he wasn't entirely sure how, uh, because remember, he's a child. <laughs> he's a teenager, he's got big dreams. And then, unfortunately, uh, someone would give him an example of what to do. Mm. Um, this happened almost the same week as someone walked into the Biltmore Hotel in Santa Barbara and shot two men dead. The gunman was 70-year-old Korkin Yanakanian, uh, and his targets were the councils of the Republic of Turkey. Ah. <laughs> well... Uh, Yanakanian uh, surrendered peacefully to the cops um, after killing the two men. And uh, said, said he simply could not forgive the Turkish government for what they did to his people and his family. Um, this had a deep impact on Monty and the idea of generational revenge and trauma and things that needed to be righted uh, began to uh, course through his mind. Of course, righted uh, is, is, is left up for debate at this point. Um, yeah. I don't think gunning down some Turkish government employees will do that, but I get it. <laughs> like... Right. He's, de he's dealing with some trauma and he doesn't exactly understand how to do it. Um, it's one, this, this is one of those problems that like, we ran into when we did the, uh, the Irish Republic series forever ago, which was then interrupted by terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you know, it, it, I, obviously I'm not in favor of gunning down innocent people, uh, but every once in a while there's like a rebel movement that you completely, or like maybe a freedom fighter, terrorist, whatever, same thing, different flavors. Um, that you kind of understand and empathize how they got there, but not their actions. Right. Um, yeah. 
This is a whole series of that. (laughs) (laughs) And it is hard because like there is, there are, there are forms of retribution and retributive justice that could happen, right? That would like, they would never make up for the loss of life, but they would, they would help the people who are left behind. But they're all too big. Like you can't as, as like Monty could not go and retrieve all of the land that Turkey stole. And that would be the thing. That would be the thing that you'd want to do. But what you can do is you can pick up arms, whether or not you should. Sarah, I got some good news for you. He's going to do both of those things eventually. (laughs) You got to try out all your options and just see which one works the best. Right. Um, Now, like I said before, uh, Monty was excelling at just about everything he did. He graduated from school a year early. And uh, instead of me and joining the army, he began university early uh, um, and went to Japan as well. Uh, w- once there, he quickly mastered uh, a conversational level of Japanese, uh, the language, and Damn. obtained a black belt in both judo and karate <laughs> and learned how to fucking do kendo. What a fucking weeb. Yeah, uh, he wasn't done, though. He then scraped together what money he had and then went on a tour of Southeast Asia. Now, this is the late 60s, early 70s, and he decided to go on a vacation to Vietnam. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 just have, just go on a vacation to a war at the age of 16. Um, just, you know. And, like, he like, he almost got killed in, like, an artillery strike, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a popular thing to do in Vietnam at the time. Yeah, yeah, it was all the, the rage, unfortunately. Um, then he returned to the United States and went to the, the University of California and doubled majored in math and history before changing to history and archaeology. Mm-hmm. Uh because he thought it'd be easier to graduate faster <laughs> while still double majoring. Okay. Sure. Not wrong. Yeah. Um, while in school, he became a student activist in both Armenian and leftist circles. And I should point out, um, by this point of his life, Monty is racist as hell. Um, <laughs> uh, his brother doesn't use that word, but I will. Um, it isn't that... So, it isn't that he hates the Turkish government, which he does. I also hate the Turkish government. They're yeah, fascists. Same. Um, he hates Turks in general. It's different, and he also really hates Kurdish people. Um, so he's just a bit of a racist. He thought why, he thought why Kurdish people? Uh, the Kurds had a huge hand in uh, yeah. perpetrating the Armenian genocide. Okay, uh, which actually is something the uh the SDF and the Rojava government, whatever the the acronym they use, is publicly apologized for. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know. Has they're the only government group in this circle that's actually attempted to apologize for the actions of the genocide. Um, now, Markar attempts to frame this as Monty could simply never forgive them for what they did uh, for the genocide, which, fair. I'm not one arguing forgiveness, but I don't hate Turks. <laughs> so, yeah. like, it's just racism. <laughs> Uh, he eventually did learn the the Turkish language, though. Um, now, this wasn't um, any kind of, like, I don't know, bridging the gap or unity type thing. No, it's he, utilitarian, right? Yeah, he wanted to learn more about his enemy, and he thought the only way he could do that is by learning Turkish, which... I can't imagine hate learning a language. Yeah, he did. He absolutely... He learned... Oh. By the time he's an adult, he spoke better Turkish than he did Armenian, which... Oh. Kind of ironic. Not gonna, yeah, not gonna don't lie. You think? Um, now, during this time, people in leftist Armenian circles began to spread rumors that soon the Shah of Iran would fall, uh, as Iran is being rocked by protests at the time. Now, we talked a lot about this dur- during our Iran Iraq War series. Go, go ahead and listen to that. I'm not going to redouble the Iranian Revolution. But for those unaware, Iran has a huge Armenian diaspora population, and many of them are leftists, and many of the early protests and organizations that would become, unfortunately, the uh, Iranian Re- uh, Islamic Revolution was actually cornered by communists, many of whom were Christians and Armenian. Um, most of those people would be killed uh, by the revolution once the Islamics, uh, the the Islamist extremists, co-opted it. Uh, unfortunately, but That's at the what time, happened with leftist movements. Yeah, funny how that works. Uh, mm. Now, Monty 
being kind of dumb at the time, assumed that, well, if Iran is being rocked by revolution, Turkey would also soon fall to leftist revolution. But he was worried that it occurred before the Armenians had organized enough to be able to seize the opportunity of a weakened Turkish state and force their collective demands on them. He was, like, hoping for the domino theory. Yeah, he he was real... Uh, Pie in the sky type, and he would yeah. be for a very long time. Um, because I mean, he's still a college student, right? And uh, he also began to read things about a group calling themselves the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia, uh, as well as a group called the Justice Commandos. Uh, now, the okay. the Justice Commandos, yes, Man. um. Now, the Secret Army was kind of like a big tent leftist organization, while the Justice Commandos were Armenian nationalists. Um, but both of them were launching shooting and bombing attacks against Turkish diplomats, airliners, and government institutions. Uh, these were, rightfully, in my opinion, called terror attacks. Um, though Monty decided to call them armed propaganda. Okay. Which I, uh, yeah, a uh, rad band name, I'll say. That's a way to spin it. Uh, that just that's just terrorism with extra steps. Uh, Sprinkles how, on top. Yeah, like I said, rad bad na- a band name, a weird way to spin that. Um, though I know people are really touchy when it comes to call things terror attacks. They have like a defined, uh, yeah, they have a definition. Uh, you know, using violence to scare or terrorize people for political means, which is like quite literally what's happening. Uh, right. You don't have to. You don't have to church it up. Uh, even if you agree with it, maybe just don't say it on Twitter or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> or write it down at all. Uh, otherwise, the uh, the uh, FBI might come and visit you. Uh, now, now in his circles at school, um, he said all of these targets were legitimate um, th- because no, he argued that these airlines and all these other things uh, were. You know, employees of a government that committed the Armenian genocide. And because that government refused to acknowledge their crime, you know, that being the Turkish government, anyone who worked for them obviously didn't either, making them a legitimate target. Despite none of these are military targets. Um, you know. It's it's one of those where like, I agree with this and I agree with that, and I do not agree with the conclusion you've come to. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like watching someone write out like long division, then come to the wrong conclusion. You're like, oh, yeah. so close. Oh, so close. You were you were right there. Uh, that is when uh, he helped form a student organization called the Armenian Student Association, or ASA. Um, Not as cool as the Justice Commandos. And it's hard to say that like, maybe he meant to have the same abbreviation as the Armenian Secret Army. Maybe he didn't. Um, now He seems smart. Yeah. It seems like a thing he'd do intentionally. Yeah. Uh, he announced the first meeting in fall of 1977. And I want you to picture this in your head. It's the late 70s. You're in college in California, mm-hmm. and you're... Armenian or, uh, you know, at least interested in Armenian cultural um, issues. And you go to this meeting and you're greeted by Monty, who at this point had stopped grooming himself. Um, <laughs> and I can tell you from personal experience, if I don't cut my hair or shave, I look like a, a fucking mountain person immediately. My hair is I'm like for thick. That full Shea look. Yeah. Like he probably looks something like the Unabomber when he was arrested. <laughs> Um, like really like white guy fro hair, huge giant beard, um, dressed in tattered clothes and flip flops. And when you met him, he was handing out Xerox copies of bombed, uh, and explosive making recipes that he had Xerox from the anarchist cookbook. To be fair, I've been to San Francisco a couple of times. This just sounds fine. I, the, sounds normal. The 1970s were fucking wild. Could you, <laughs> could you imagine like going to like UW, uh, and like, Going to your oh class and you're just greeted by a, a fucking mountain man looking motherfucker handing you uh, directions how to build a bomb and him not yeah. getting arrested. No, now it'd be like directions for how to make the perfect granola mix. <laughs> like the- I don't know which of those I'd prefer, honestly. Both are good. Yeah, like, uh, would you like one from stack A or one from stack B? And like, that's 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 something that's going to come up like repeatedly is like. The past was fucking wild when it came to stuff like this, because like, you know, in the US, this is, you know, almost like considered like the golden age of terrorism. There's a lot of right. uh, like airplane hijackings and like hijacking. Car- yeah. Like Carlos the Jackal was in the wild and yeah. stuff like that. But like the US had like 9-11 hadn't happened yet. So a vaguely Middle Eastern man hanging out bomb recipes <laughs> did not 
scare anybody. It's fine. <laughs> um, then a couple months later at 3 a.m., a bomb blasted through the door of UCLA professor Standiford Shaw. Now, nobody was hurt, and Shaw joked that he must have given out too many Fs during the last quarter. <laughs> um, now, that was not the reason. The real reason, probably, but unconfirmed, was because Shaw and his wife had recently published a two-volume book titled The History of the Ottoman Empire and Modern Turkey, in which they dismissed the Armenian genocide as propaganda peddled by Armenian nationalists. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's not good. Um, now, Monty was, to the, nobody's surprise, immediately a suspect in the bombing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, mostly because he'd just been, you know, handing out bomb making literature on a college campus, uh, and screaming about like Armenian rights. Yeah. Um, and you know, he was also a, a vocally militant activist and hung out with other people like him, leading him to be put on the FBI's radar for at least a few years and certainly not for the last time. Uh, mm -hmm. however, they could never pin the bombing on him and eventually had to drop it. Now, I, me and Markar actually agree on this, that we don't think it was Monty, um, because it's not that we don't think Monty was capable of building a bomb or doing a terrorism. We'll get to that. But mostly because at this point, he seemed to be fighting nonviolent battles, like getting into shit fits with his school over an Armenian genocide display. Um, okay. Like, he was arguing about arts and culture. He wasn't like, you know, it's time to grab the Kalashnikov. Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> I, the only thing you have to lose is your chain. <laughs> yeah, he he hadn't quite graduated to the point of of uh, exploding things yet, and more importantly, he had no idea how. The reason why he would build a bomb later is because he learned how to do it in fucking Lebanon. Uh, he did. What was he handing out Xerox to, like bomb recipes for then? Uh, maybe for other people. Like he wasn't. Just I mean, for inspo. I mean, I have no doubt. Like Monty was smart enough that if he wanted to build a very simple bomb, he could have done it. But right, but. He wouldn't actually attempt it until he got taught how to do it by actual bomb makers. It's just, he doesn't seem like the type of person who would have kept it quiet either. No, he probably would have bragged about it. Um, to somebody. Yeah, he would have wrote a zine or whatever, I don't know, <laughs> ed edgy college kids in the 70s. <laughs> um, now, uh, Monty finally graduated and accepted a grad position at Oxford. Uh, now, he argued that um, uh, being in graduate school for archaeology would allow him to go to ancient Armenia or modern-day Turkey. The real reason was probably because uh, it would make it much easier to get a visa into the Soviet Union hmm. and get to Soviet Armenia and study in Armenia proper. Uh, because he had already tried to get that visa and had been rejected multiple times. Um, so he assumed if he was attached to Oxford University, they would let him in. Um, now, during this time, he moved in with his cousins, the Barbarians. Um, who were shocked to find he could hardly speak more than a few, word, a few words of Armenian, despite years of teaching himself. Uh, so he's not great at everything. Um, though he still couldn't go to Armenia, they recommend he go to Lebanon instead. Um, he could simply move in amongst the country's massive Armenian population and immerse himself that way. So not to mention Armenia or sorry Lebanon was in the middle of a pretty horrible civil war and he saw Lebanon as a gateway into the armed struggle for, of you know the oh, Armenian yeah. people the gateway war yeah uh an idea i mean he has been romanticizing revolution and armed struggle for years which you know sure. never leads to problematic things um now he saw himself as a militant revolutionary one that just so happened to not do either one of those things yet um he he was desperately looking for a war to fight. Um, and I guess, I mean, at this point, the closest he'd come is dodging artillery while on vacation in South Vietnam. And this would be his first time actually fighting. Um, now, Lebanon had fractured at this point into a multi-sided civil war with each religion, ethnicity, and nationality forming effectively their own armed factions and trying to kill each other at various points. Um, now, obviously, that is not an exhaustive uh study of the lebanese civil war no i think you got it yeah uh i'm actually an expert on the subject don't uh don't you email me yeah <laughs> now uh armenians generally lived in their own place is is a neighborhood called the burj hamoud i believe uh but generally known as like the armenian quarter um and 
He believed that the Armenian quarter would be under siege uh, and needed dedicated revolutionaries in order to save their neighborhood. Now that ended up being partially true. The Armenian quarter was in a very weird, precarious position in this war, where that they didn't really want to fight over Lebanese government. They just wanted people to fucking leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the more people were nice. Um, now, once he and his cousin had gotten to Lebanon, they realized they really had no idea what they'd gotten themselves into. Uh, while in the UK, they thought that the conflict boiled down to a loose collection of leftists, Muslims, and Palestinians facing off against Christian fascists who call themselves the Falange. Um, but, the Falange? Yeah, it, 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 there's a whole thing about it. I'm not going to go into it. Um, Aren't those like finger bones? Those are phalanges. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which I believe is the word that uh, Phoebe from Friends used for her fake last name is Regina Falange. Uh, solid, yeah. solid name. Um, but that wasn't really the case when they got to the Armenian quarter. The Armenians, as always, living together and running their own affairs pretty much wherever they live, have decided to con- consider themselves neutral in the greater Lebanese conflict. But what really this did is made them an ally and enemy of everyone at the war at some point or another. Um, Monty showed up to the local militia. He assumed he would be greeted as a fellow comrade revolutionary, but instead they dismissed him as some random American kid who was going on a, a war vacation, which had happened quite a few times at this point. Um, totally wrong. Yeah. They gave him a rifle, though, which he had never had any training on and sent him out to a militia guard post without any training on how to fire it. They're like, I don't think Monty had fired a gun before in his life. I... I just imagine them like laughing at them, like laughing to themselves. So they send him off, like, "Okay, sure, kid." Yeah, uh, and he was—he's not coming back. Yeah, like like most, I don't know, uh, people caught up in their own dreams. He was pretty disappointed by the people he met, in that they were just people. Um, yeah, he had filled his head with the idea of tough, take no shit revolutionaries fighting off reactionaries from every angle. Instead, what he found were a loose collection of child soldiers, teenagers, and old men who hardly slept, chugged gallons of coffee, did drugs, and spent their time playing cards and daydreaming about escaping the war and going to the United States. (laughs) Yep. Which, yeah, this is their life, man. (laughs) Yeah, man. They can't leave. Yeah, you chose to came here. If they had a choice, they wouldn't be sitting out in their bombed out fucking bunker playing cards and- get shot. Yeah, drinking. At first, pretty much everybody hated him. Now, um, it had become kind of commonplace for Armenians uh, from the U.S. Uh, to run to Lebanon because they want to be part in a greater struggle for the Armenian people, experiencing the realities of war, realizing it's fucking terrible, and running off again. Uh, so they didn't have time for his bullshit. Then, unfortunately, um, uh, people began to spread rumors that he was the CIA or the KGB or MI6 or something. Uh, be, and the reason for this is because when he finally did get shot at, he didn't even react. He was just like, oh, I'm being shot at. <laughs> so, like, the idea that he was just some dumb American kid was, like, discarded and figured he must be some super spy. Uh, no, he's just kind of dumb. <laughs> like, a sniper took a shot at him and he just, like, stood there. Like, which I've been there before. Like, the first time I got shot yeah. at, I didn't react either. Because your brain doesn't react and like, oh, well, someone's trying to kill me. It's, right. what just it- happened? <laughs> <laughs> it just seems so like fake, right? Yeah, like that can't that can't really happen, right? Uh, but Monty didn't let the suspicions of the people around him slow him down, though he probably should have. Um, <laughs> instead, he he started to uh, get up in his own head again, and instead of just becoming a militiaman around his fellow Armenians and fitting in, which he still had not done, he wanted to start a collective farm and military training camp up in the Becca Valley. Um, and so he pitched this idea to the local political parties of uh, of the Armenian quarter. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into a lot of Armenian politics because they're very weird. Um, but there's two main competing political parties, both of whom fucking hate one another. And in Lebanon, they kind of ruled shit like a mafia. Uh, I don't know if that's still true or not. Uh, but like, there's uh, one who is mostly right-wing nationalists, one who are mostly left-wing nationalists, and they fucking hate one another. Uh, and they're constantly maneuvering to fuck one another over. Uh, and you, and, and most importantly, if you're an outsider like Monty is and you go to Lebanon, you don't piss them off because they will kill you. Um, so he pitched this idea to his training camp in the Becca Valley and immediately got laughed at because, like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> like. Right. 
Yeah, like, what you know, the fuck no, do you know about even, like, farms, let alone, mili- like, militia training? Yeah, yeah. He he wants to do a communism out in the hills, and they're like, fuck off, kid. Um, now, Monty got kind of pissed that the Armenians who actually lived in this place didn't let him just storm in and take over <laughs> after seven weeks. And um, it, also, everybody thinking he was a CIA agent began to nag at him. So he left Lebanon for Iran. Which obviously used to be much easier than it is today. Yeah. <laughs> now, his goal was still a Soviet visa, something he'd been trying to get for the whole time he was in Lebanon. Uh, but uh, in order to do that, you have to like call people on the phone and make appointments, which is very hard to do uh, due to phone service pretty much being blown out by artillery strikes and stuff. Um, but while there, he made some contacts uh, and with some friends back in California who then traveled to Iran to take part in protests against the Shah, who were still uh, taking place and largely led by Iranian communists. Unfortunately for Monty, he found out firsthand that the Shah suppressed these protests with machine gun fire. Uh, Because when he went there the next day after a protest, he watched soldiers of the Iranian Iranian Imperial Army clearing the square of corpses with a bulldozer and soaking up tons of blood with sawdust. Uh, yeah, this happened a lot when the sh- before the Shah finally ran. Um, though he didn't let this scare him off uh, because at this point he had been shot at and you know has seen enough stuff, so he didn't yeah, quite run off. Corpse bulldozer? That's that's a different that's level. level. Yeah, yeah, that's up there with Corpse Road. But you know, um, <laughs> Corpse Dozer is Corpse Road's third oh, album. God, the worst kind of kill dozer. <laughs> oh God. Um, while he was there, he became an English teacher and and then. Uh, Realize that uh, they're kind of being paid terribly for how much uh, the staff is being uh, paid or the, how much the, the school is being paid. So they were teaching English for what is mostly the upper crust of Iranian society. So elites would send their kids there to learn English and him and other teachers were teaching them. And they realized they weren't getting fuck all for pay. So he quickly unionized his workplace and led his, his fellow teachers on a strike. Um which immediately led to them all being fired uh, because that's what happens when your country's ran by an <laughs> asshole and you have no labor rights. Um, yep. Yep. Thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore. Doesn't happen in this century. Nope. Certainly not to Instacart. Um, or Amazon. Or Tesla. Uh, w- <laughs> or Walmart. <laughs> While he was planning his next move in Iran, he got word from Lebanon that the fascist phalangist militias were surrounding the Armenian quarter and demanding tribute in order to ward off an attack. And it was only a matter of time before shit popped off for real in the neighborhood. So he quickly got back to Beirut. Uh, and at this point, half the city was uh, surrounded by Falange and the other half was surrounded by the Syrian army. Uh, and they also used to be allies. But now we're shooting at one another because that's how things happen in Lebanon. And while they were shelling at one another, their, lands, uh, their shells began to land pretty short directly into the Armenian quarter. Uh, the bombardment went on for eight days, and Monty hid the entire time in a basement with civilians as the city was pulverized around them. Now, remember the Armenian secret army from a while back? The one that... Yeah. Like, well, one of uh, Monty's dreams now, because they were, he, had, he had heard that they're headquartered in Lebanon uh, and Beirut, somewhere in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, and he wanted to link up with them and join them. Like That was what he wanted to do. But there was a small problem. He could not find them. You know, the, the secret army part, I guess. Um, so he just I thought it was just the name. I thought it was just a clever name. <laughs> yeah, I thought like no, for real. Like we're right here, but we're also secret, and you you can't find us. But also, we're doing propaganda, armed propaganda, or whatever. Yeah, Monty walking around like, hey, have you heard about this secret army? <laughs> uh, so he just kind of started his own branch, which. <laughs> <laughs> Which I well, sh- I should point out was not what the secret army was about. Like they weren't like a a, a leaderless resistance type thing. Um, right. It's not like anybody can be Antifa. Yeah. Um, and they were not looking to start franchises, and people warned him not to do this. Uh, but Monty didn't care. Uh, and he was, sh- but he was also short on money, so he he wanted to like. What I think his plan was was I'm going to call myself the secret army. I'm going to go do secret army stuff. The secret army is going to know, like, yo, this must have been Monty. Yeah. We need this guy on our team. That's what I could I see happening. The problem was, is Monty was broke as fuck and had, and had no money to buy any guns or explosives or anything. 
and like the militia only lent him an AK. Like he couldn't like just take it. Like he had to he had to turn it in when he wasn't using it. So like he had to go buy some guns. Um, and you know Monty was a guy who thought almost throughout his entire life that he was the smartest, most important guy in whatever room he happened to be standing in. He was an idealist caught up in his own grand plans that only existed in his and his head alone. Um, he was a revolutionary without the revolution. Uh, and while Amanti wouldn't act on his plans immediately, uh, he was planning on doing something big. Uh, though some would call this prepping a terror attack, and those mm-hmm. people would probably be right. <laughs> um, I've heard it called armed propaganda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, also... I guess armed propaganda is corpse roads fourth album. Um, (laughs) After this, the 1979 as the Iranian revolution took off in full steam and most of Monty's friends had been killed by Islamic revolution of revolutionaries. uh, The Kurds of Iran, as well as the, the fringe remnants of the leftist revolutionaries, many of them also Mm -hmm. Kurdish and Armenian stood up uh, against the Islamic government and kind of joined forces. Monty, it turns out, was willing to overlook his own prejudice against the Kurds when a revolution was involved and quickly bailed on Lebanon again and went back to Iran. Uh, Now, like before, Monty asked to join the rebellion uh, against the Islamic revolution on the front lines, and he was told to fuck off in short order. Yeah, who the fuck are you? And and when when he tried to rally Armenian support for the Kurds, a historically tough thing to do, he was denounced as an American spy again. (laughs) <laughs> yeah I can see it soon it became clear that he needed to get the fuck out of there before somebody shot him and after more revolutionary letdowns he simply went back to Beirut Che Guevara Monty was not quite yet <laughs> once there uh, uh, the uh, it, he learned that the phalangist militia had killed several Armenians and uh, things between the two sides were tense again they almost always were but they weren't shooting at each other every day there was like a series of you know, uh, armistices, I guess you could call them, which would immediately collapse. Um, but one night while he was on guard, several armed phalangists approached Monty's posts and he shot at them. And you know, remember, Monty doesn't have any training yet. He doesn't quite know what to do. And he's also alone. How long has he been there? Yeah. He, so he, at this point. he charged at them, fil- firing wildly. <laughs> Uh, before taking off down a nearby alley, popping out from a different alley, and shooting at them again. Um, I don't know if this is his goal, but he bounced back and forth so much that he tricked the militiamen into thinking there were several more people than there actually <laughs> were. <laughs> and That's some cartoon bullshit. Yeah, Monty's spastic ass kept them pinned down alone <laughs> until backup could arrive. Damn. Uh, but while he had accounted himself well on the Lebanese battlefield, he'd also got involved in Lebanese politics, uh, something that ended up with him being kidnapped at least twice. <laughs> By the same group? Uh, probably. Um, black bagged? Uh, another, so and then, uh, another group of, like, Armenian politicians also kidnapped him, and he was also, uh, someone attempted to murder him four times, uh, almost all of them by o- other Armenians. <laughs> Probably won by phalangists, but no one's really sure. They're just over his shit. Um, yeah. Uh, he eventually made contact with a Fatah agent named Abu Nadal, uh, Abu Nadal, who taught him how to build a car bomb. So that's where he learns. Okay. Okay. Monty decided that he would kill a local militia meter- leader that was opposed to the phalangists. Now, this sounds dumb. Because it is, but it makes sense in Monty's brain. His idea was to blow up this militia leader and then blame it on the phalangists. Yeah, I, yeah, I knew that's where that was going. It never works out. No, uh, he wanted to do. He wanted to do a false flag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, an amateur false flag. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, so he would obviously force the two sides to go to war against one another and leave the Armenians alone. When he set the bomb off, it killed some random bystanders and a bodyguard, leaving the main target unharmed. <laughs> Worse still, the leader blamed the Palestinians, not the Phalanges. Oh. And then launched attacks against them. I'm starting to think that Monty isn't good at politics either. <laughs> He's good at everything except, like, the whole, you know, revolutionary part at this point. Yeah, it's like uh, Monty, like, uh, certainly this attempt at revolution won't be bad this time. Ah, uh, well, nevertheless. Nevertheless? Uh, alas. Uh, alas, he, uh... 
He persevered. <laughs> um, <laughs> ne- yeah, never- he persisted. Nevertheless, Monty persevered. Um, throughout the- this failed attack, can- uh, so he was kind of right in-, in one thing. Uh, by setting off a giant bomb, he did get the attention of the secret army. Ugh. Uh, the group he had just been kind of cosplaying as when he blew up an entire city block. Uh, and he met with a recruiter, a man that he noted had the worst teeth he had ever seen. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's impressive that stuck out to him immediately, which says they must have been awful. Um, yeah. Monty immediately joined the group, and it couldn't have happened at a better time, because the next day someone warned him that he needed to leave the Armenian quarter immediately, or a different Armenian political group was going to kill him. So that's exactly what he did, moving across the city before his ass finally got got for fucking around. Um, their, their contact brought him to a local secret army headquarters, where Monty met their leader, Hartuyan Takushian. Uh, he, now, he was uh, an Iraqi Armenian, and he goes by several different names. Um, I, I, people think that this is his birth name. Um, he is mostly known by Hajap Hajapian, uh, which also mm-hmm. seems to be a uh, a fake name. He went, dude it has like a dozen up. different fucking names. Um, I'm going by his birth name, which is Dakushian, I think. Um, <laughs> the man has layers, like an onion. Yeah, like an ogre. Um, as uh, he had been a a part of an Ira- of an Iraqi revolutionary group before he turned into an Armenian Iraqi revolution revolu- revolutionary. Um, and he had been a member of the Revolutionary Socialist Group, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Um, okay. Now, during this time, uh, this that's where the secret army kind of branched up, branched off from. Like the 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 Popular Front was like, yeah, you can start your own, own Armenian group under our command, and he was like, word. So like, it wasn't like this independent group of heroic revolutionaries. And right. Instead, it was just this guy and a couple other people working under the umbrella of a marxist Leninist group and under an even larger umbrella of the PLO or the Pre- Palestinian Libera- Liberation Organization. Um, now, there's some interesting, weird connections that Takushian had. Now, under the ages, uh, uh, while he was 16 years old, he came over to the, the personal training of a guy named Wadi Haddad. Now, he was a socialist militant who had connections to Black September. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, no. For people unaware, Black September is the group that carried out the Munich Olympic attacks and killed Israeli uh, athletes. Um, and there's also a rumor. Um, now, for people who are unaware, after those attacks, Israel launched Operation Wrath of God to hunt down and kill these people um, that they think had even loosely connected uh, to these attacks, which is how Wadi Haddad would eventually die via poison toothpaste. Um, though, poison toothpaste? Yeah, uh, it, it's unconfirmed, um, but it, it, it sounds like something they might do. The, uh, the uh, Operation Wrath of God people were really into car bombs themselves, um, because Golda Meir, the Israeli prime minister, wanted to terrorize them like they had terrorized the Israelis. So that involved a lot of explosives. Um, uh, this group was also uh, allied with the Kurdish Workers Party, or the PKK, uh, because there's nothing like bonding over the destruction of the Turkish state. Um, it brings families together. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the revolution was the friends we made along the way. Um, <laughs> and admittedly, uh, working and, and living with the PKK actually deeply affected Mani in a very positive way. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, Abdallah Ajalan's organization has some pretty strict rules when it comes to like how... Uh, the soldiers or the fighters, the PKK, uh, present an act um, mm-hmm. like not smoking or drinking, though the smoking thing is very loosely uh, enforced, sure. but mostly like don't be drunk and don't be assholes, don't commit crimes, right. stuff like that. Um, There's a lot of like don't victimize people that are like at your level or lower. Yeah. I mean, now obviously that's a hell of a juxtaposition for the PKK because they car bomb civilians. So like, oh. you know, yeah, you know. <laughs> Um, now, after starting his group and funding it with money from his buddy who owned a bookstore, the secret army bombed multiple targets and shot several diplomats, creating something of a beef with a rival assassination squad that we already talked <laughs> about, the Justice Commandos. Um, now, at this point, things are so confused, and I'm saying by this point, I mean modern history today, that nobody's entirely sure who killed who, uh, because... It- was, <laughs> was there, like... I? 
Was there like a Venn diagram between the ASA and the Justice Commandos where like some people kind of went back and forth between the two groups? The, politically, they were very different. And it seems like oh, okay. it seems like the Justice Commandos were much better organized. Um, they had a much better name. Yeah, they do. And Takushian's kind of an asshole. Um, and he okay. he's he's not very smart. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about <laughs> that more in the next episode. But uh, what he did was instead of trying to build his organization up, which he was trying to do and, and failing mostly. Uh, he would simply hear, because he had connections through, I mean, the Justice Commandos were buying illegal firearms and explosives just like he was. So, like, they had mutual relations and friends with people in the, in the, in, That's right. in the black market like, community. It's only so big of an area that they're based out of. Like, oh, and only so big of a community that they can operate within. Yeah. Did you sell machine guns to a different Armenian? Ah, okay. I know <laughs> who that is. Um, so, like, whenever he heard about a, a, a bomb or a gun attack going off, he would immediately call his press contacts and take credit for it <laughs> for, for the secret army rather than the Justice Commandos. Right. And then the Justice Commandos would do the same thing. So, at this point, nobody is fucking sure who killed who or who bombed what because they're all lying. Yeah. Stolen terrorist um, valor, if you will. <laughs> it's the only good stolen valor. At one point, Tagushian pissed off the wrong factional group uh, and was shot 12 times at a KGB drive by, uh, but survived. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, like, he he's trying to do the same thing Monty was doing, but slightly better. Mostly because he has more he experience. Better connections. Yeah, he has much better connections. And at some point, someone um, opined that he had KGB connections, which was probably true. Um, right. Because, I mean, when you think about it, all these Armenian groups are targeting Turkish targets, which is an enemy of the Soviet Union. Mm. So they're like, yeah, yeah, sure, buddy. Like, we're all about Armenian liberation. Let's go blow up Tur- Turkish stuff. Uh, it was also at this time, like, the. The KGB was kind of just throwing money at any little group like that. Like, they didn't have to give them a ton of money. Right. Most of these groups are so poor, like, anything that they gave helped. Right. And it was really cheap for the KGB to just garner support that way. Yeah, I mean, it was just like they openly support the PLO as well. They didn't give a shit about yeah. Palestinian liberation. <laughs> like <that>. No. <laughs> no, but if we give you a little bit of money and you go, like, bother people we don't like. Yeah. Sure, why not? Yeah, like, taking over fucking planes and bombing airports and, you know, yeah, it yeah. keeps it keeps your enemies occupied and looking internally rather than lo- like worrying about um, the Soviet Union. And yeah, you know, Soviet politics. Yeah, yeah, it's really great to um, be the thorn in the side of a major power of the, like uh, during the Cold War, like the U.S. or what happens to be a lot of the time France or Israel, um, because you know the Soviet Union supported a lot of the Arab states against Israel. So like. Yeah, like they don't give a shit about Armenia. They don't care. Give a shit about Arab liberation. They just want to fucking cause chaos, which yeah. they did. Um, so, like now, there's no proof that the KGB supported them, um, but it certainly seems like they would, as because remember they're under the greater PLO umbrella. Uh, so you know, trickle down support, <laughs> uh, trickle down terrorism. Yeah. Now, Monty was pretty fucking let down by the secret army when he finally got to see it. He called it a rinky dink operation. Uh, but he decided that it was better than anything else he had going on and threw his lot with them anyway. Uh, probably because this is the first revolutionary group he attempted to get into that actually let him in. Um, <laughs> it's, Choosy beggars and all that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, a revolutionary free agency. And he waited to, like, he didn't have the intangibles that the bigger groups needed. Like, he's in the farm club team of the PLO. He needs to get himself a terrorist agent. Yeah, that's right. Um now, the big letdown here for Monty was not the size of the operation, but rather how it was run. He assumed that the secret army was ran by someone like him, you know, a, a, what he considered a romantic revolutionary intellectual, or at least someone who was well-read. Um, instead, Takushian was a high school dropout who hardly spoke a word of Armenian. Um, and worse still, the secret army had no overarching political goals. Uh, they were loosely Marxist um, and kind of sort of talking about liberating the occupied territories of greater Armenia. But it, w- it, it was mostly just about the violence. Yeah, just freebasing car bombs. This is fine. Yeah. Like, like if you w- if you would have asked Takushian why he's blowing up Turkish airplanes, he would have no idea. 
He just hated Turks. Fuck Turkey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He just really hated Turkish people. So it's mm-hmm. it's kind of a racist death squad at this point with vague political overtones. Uh and, and like Takushin himself did not say um that his secret army, because you know, even small groups, um, which you know, the PLO is not a small group at this point, uh, but like other groups like it would say, no, we our end goal is to liberate Palestine. Or our end goal is to, you know, destroy the Israeli state or whatever. Uh, they have goals. Um, yeah. Takushian admitted he just wanted to make noise. Which had, you know what? It's very demoralizing. I respect that. It's demoralizing. But at least he's honest. But he's honest about it. I mean, sure, he's honest. But, like, imagine, like, you're, like, a young revolutionary and, you know, you're like, ah, I want to bring down the Turkish state. Takushian's like, yeah, I'm not about that action, boss. <laughs> I'm just about throwing hand grenades at stewardesses. <laughs> I mean, uh, to be fair, like Monty could have, I don't know, probably could have done any amount of research and figured that out. Yeah. And he was, uh, his thing was, is um, this group is obviously doing things like they're doing armed propaganda. So he wants to join them. <laughs> you know, they're doing terrorism um, and he wants to join them and take part in this. And he believes like, well, you know, once I'm in, I'll be able to politically <laughs> reform them. I, I can change him. <laughs> I can change them. I just need time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now, he, you just if you can get them in a conference room and you can talk about theory for like four <laughs> to eight hours. Now, he didn't see any of these as warning signs per se. Um, now, Takushian then took him under his wing and began training him, which was about as half-assed as you could imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is the first actual training that Monty had received. Uh, but the secret army was about as broke as Monty, so they didn't really have any money for bullets. So, like, you could go out to the range and, like, shoot a gun, but there was no, like, firearms training. And instead, Takushian would just use his personal pistol to fire at Monty's feet. Um, like, he would just pop out from around corners and, like, kind of ambush him. And... Uh, <laughs> we, we don't have bullets for you to practice your marksmanship, however... I will we have just enough rounds for me to shoot at your legs. I will fire at your feet like an Acme cartoon. Um, <laughs> and he did this until Monty no longer flinched when he like jumped out and shot at him. And I don't know if this is Monty becoming endured to like gunfire or of him just being over to Gushin's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at some point, just fucking shoot me, man. Yeah, just put one in my fucking Fuck shin. It. I'll go back to California, you asshole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, though... Eventually, I assume Takushian got bored of shooting at his new recruits um, and decided that it was time for Monty to go on his first mission to go do some armed propaganda terrorism of his own. And that is what we'll pick up next week. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Does it go about as well as I think it's going to go? I will say on the loosest definition of success, Monty succeeds. (laughs) I don't know if I feel good or bad about that. That's a good way to be conflicted right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it was like me uh, learning about Monty in the first place, uh, you know, because my knowledge of Monty worked backwards, which was, ah, he was a, like an Armenian military hero. And that's right. pretty much all I knew about him. And then I learned like, right. oh, a lot of car bombs, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, which is interesting because this doesn't happen that often. Um, you know, like uh, normally... Uh, obviously, Armenia was in a very, very unique position to be in, which we will talk about at length uh, on part three. But um, you know, it, it, normally, someone like him isn't normalized in a state structure. Yeah. They're like, no, no, right. come on. I mean, obviously, as like outside state actors, you get people who are outright terrorists being used for nefarious purposes. But like Armenia, uh, Armenia made this guy a lieutenant colonel. Um. Posthumously. Posthumously? Okay. Well, he was, I believe he was a major while he was still alive, but uh, he was th- one of the best overall commanders in Armenia during the first Artsakh War. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, this is a guy that had no military training, like for real. Yeah. Um, never went to a military well, this, academy. At this point, he's in his 20s and he barely speaks Armenian. Yeah, and he would die uh, speaking very bad Armenian. Uh, the the problem is like he learned in Lebanon, um, and Le- uh, Lebanese Armenians speak a, a a weird form of Armenian. Right. Um, but like our, like the Armenian language, like there's Eastern, there's Western, and there's different dialects from within. And he just kind of picked it up. And like you can uh, get on uh, YouTube and pull up 
interviews of him speaking to people and like he's uh, it, he has a very hard time understanding people uh but like he's able to like communicate with them anyway <laughs> um I, I but mean, yeah from military stuff i'm sure it's it's not that bad he figured it out obviously um yeah. so how you feeling about monty at the end of part one like not great Ooh, that you know? your opinion is going to go down next episode. Oh no! <laughs> just like he, he sounds like like you described him as like that edgy teen, and even in, into his twenties in Lebanon and in, you know, in all these conflicts, he still just sounds like he's that edgy teen who thinks he knows best, but has no experience. Yeah, you know, to his credit, he does a lot of reflection later on in his life, and I say later on in his That's life, good. but I think he dies when he's thirty-five. He it's That's a rough close. looking thirty-five though. <laughs> um, but you know, he, he admits that like he was a fucking idiot, pretty much. Like I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Um, but <laughs> yeah, he he's very much edgy teen. But now uh, he actually is doing doing some revolutionary activities, terrorism. Mm. Um, some armed propaganda. Yeah, some some of that armed propaganda he loves so much. So. Sarah, thank you uh, for joining me and, and continuing to join me as our uh, on our journey of learning about Armenia's greatest military hero, Asterix, to come from California. Um, <laughs> I really don't like... The he, finest export America has. I really would like to say that he is Armenia's best military commander because in modern times, there has been there's never been a more successful one than him. And that includes last year's conflict in 2020. Armenian military completely collapsed. Um, and like <clears throat> the Armenian military collapsed in the nineties as well. And there was people like Monty and more specifically Monty himself that held it together. Um, so I, I, I don't want to say he's the greatest military commander in Armenian history, but he certainly is in modern Armenian history. Uh, and even though he's a suburban kid from California, which is all very weird. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us. Um, everybody, thank you for joining us on, on part one. Uh, part two next week. Uh, it gets bad. I can't wait. <laughs> bad. I like it when things get bad. Didn't you're on the right podcast. <laughs>